Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, I want to thank our guests for giving us uh, 20 minutes or so of their time to sort of wrap this film up and kind of wrap all of our heads around the movie. And thanks all of you for coming and those of you who are staying for the discussion. So um, the first, it's a heavy duty movie. It's, it's, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go pretty multidisciplinary here. We might even take disciplinary action if we if it comes down to it, but but um, <laughs> but but I wanted to get your initial impressions, both of you, of the film. And Gigi, I know that you've now seen this a couple of times, but you came into it completely cold. I'd love to get your sort of initial impressions about the about the film. I actually unexpectedly enjoyed it a lot because it reminded me a lot of Andrei Tarkovsky's movies, and he's my one of my favorite directors. I'm kind of used to this sort of mm -hmm. slow poetic, like, let it sink in stuff. I could just like it, artistically. Oh, believe me, so are we. <laughs> You're in the right place. So in, in terms of the sort of, um, in a way, it could almost be seen that this, the um, the science of the crab migration is is sort of a an extended metaphor that runs all the way through, but it does sort of make you think, why do, why do animals uh, move in bodies from place to place? Um, because we see humans sort of moving and sort of somewhat obstructed in their migration from place to place. And we also see these crabs moving from place to place. Why, why do we move from place to place? For crabs, that's a pretty simple answer. They need to release their uh, larvae into the water because that's land crabs, but not, they're not like all the way land crabs. They kind of... Uh, Adapted to live on land, but still they can re uh, cannot make their babies in the on land. So they need to release their uh, babies in the water. Maybe they just need one more evolutionary step to actually learn to make proper babies in the burrow on the island. But so far, all the females—it's only females. So half of the crab population—that's what you see. The other half is staying in the forest. Uh, yeah, the, the males. And uh, so the females just go there, release the eggs. Uh, there, is, there is a uh, larvae. The larvae come back in a couple of weeks' time in tiny little crablets. And uh, there is a back migration, which is not nearly as obvious because they're tiny. Uh, and they go and populate the little burrows on the island. And that's uh, So for, for crabs, I don't think... I guess what... The, the contrast which actually strikes me in the movie is that why, we're, we're so kind to the crabs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're generally, it's like this easily expressed kindness to like random creature on the planet, which is not even terribly charismatic. But uh, we, why cannot we kind of extend it all the way to the rest of the animal world, including humanity? It's, it's maddening. And, and at the center, uh, we have someone who does what you do for a living largely. Is a, is a, she's a therapist, and she's trying to work on this trauma. What, what were some of your impressions from having, having watched the film? Well, uh, you said that this was multidisciplinary in an extreme way. So in answer to your question about migration, um, I was thinking, I mean, really, I literally just thought of this poem by Hafiz, the Sufi poet, who writes that everything that uh, moves is, in, is thirsty. Um, so, you know, like, like a more poetic response to why all beings migrate is um, there's a kind of thirst, you know, for life. And um, so I was thinking about that during, uh, during the movie. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tough, it's a painful movie to listen to the accounts of families being ripped apart. Um, and of uh, somebody whose hands are tied by the structural violence of the, this massive you know, uh, detention center. Um, and you know, uh, she reaches a point where she's you know, experiencing secondary trauma, and uh, she says, you know, I'm overwhelmed, she's having caregiver fatigue, and um, most importantly, I think in this film, she's experiencing what has been called moral injury, where she can't do the work that she has been hired to do. She can't, they're not, they're, they're keeping them away from being helped, and she's seeing them decline and get worse. So she goes into despair and decides she um, can't do the work anymore. So, you know, that's, um, the, the trauma is now systemic and the nervous system or the distress is now um, 
experienced by all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is that kind of um, story. And uh, I think it's, you know, it serves us well to look into the face of what we're experiencing in our own country and all around the world, obviously, right? So I'm happy that, you know, that they made it without kind of offering us that glimmer of hope and light at the end, mm -hmm. um, because we can't have that all the time, you know? Are, are we, as, as homo sapiens, are we um, truly sentient? Are we semi-sentient in terms of how we, because I look at spring break in like Florida as kind of like a spawning ritual yeah. in a weird kind of way. There are all kinds it of like- It used to be much worse. Go back 5,000 years, dude. <laughs> but, but are we, but are we as advanced as these, as these crabs, let's say, even? It, it seems like we've got a lot of work to do just in order to avoid being um, cruel to ourselves and being cruel to, to others of our, of, our, uh, of our type. Are we there yet? Do we have a long way to go? Uh, I can say something, but, uh, <laughs> uh, since uh, I also teach evolution, including human evolution. Uh, there is, uh, we've come a long way to become a better, uh, humans since uh, our evolutionary history like much better we used to just kill and eat every 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 other as a human if we could just keep the females i mean seriously mm -hmm. it's like uh but i won't tell you like horrible stories which happened in the beginning of the bronze age and even if you just remember the uh, middle ages even like a hundred years ago when people just would uh be uh, having fun with those crabs, just driving over them and laughing their asses off because it's so much fun, like squishing wildlife. I mean, uh, uh, as well as just killing every other human who is not like them, who is like, uh, I mean, we're getting better. We're just not quite there yet. We're not quite there yet, we're, but we're there on the road. Though. <laughs> we're on the road to getting there. I wonder if we have any sort of questions, contributions, observations, or anything from our audience here. We picked a, a really tough movie to kind of wrap our heads around in just a couple of minutes after seeing it. Um, I think that for me, after the first time I saw it, it took me about a day, and I went, yes, oh yes, I, I got it. So, But I'm wondering if we have any questions or observations. Um, you just can't afford to pay a panel like this by the hour, so, so let's use them while we can. I really like the way you ended your question, that you can see the value. Um, because I think it's it's so implicit, and you know it's kind of like with the crabs, you know, like in a way, you know, there's this. Um, so narrative is so important for us as humans. You know, when people talk about talk therapy, it's not really just talk. It's really neural integration and sharing this nervous system that makes it, gives us a sense of cohesiveness, and. Um, you know, neuroscience has really done a lot to show how regulating for the nervous system narrative is, but it also has the other side of it, which is we can get kind of like overly, you know, brainy and intellectual and, you know, write the story so many times that it start, starts to kind of get left brain and kind of dead, like an too analytical. So the beauty of Santre, um, and it's so, she, she's a very intuitive therapist, you know, you notice the quietness in her demeanor and the, the softness in her. You know, she's not just like being smart. And she's, she's really hands-on with her kids. And there's this really beautiful contrast between, you know, the systemic violence of the, de of the detention center and like her relationship with her husband. You know, he just holds her quietly. He doesn't start giving her advice. And she's not being kind of like this super overachieving mom with her kids. It's just sort of like touch. And so Santre is a very um, nonverbal. It's, it's quieter. It's more sensory. It goes right to, um, it's much more implicit. And you create it in the moment. And I actually, I did Santre myself. I am not joking, yesterday with a friend of mine. I went to see her new office. And um, for somebody like me, who's kind of overly story oriented, you know, my own narrative and my ideas and blah, blah, blah. I loved it. And I do Santre myself, but to be uh, the client, so to speak, it's a very, um, 
you know, there's so much of our communication is nonverbal, and we're not that culture, you know. We're like a yak yak, yada yada culture. Uh, so Santre is a therapy model that's out there. You can find Santre therapists. It's not like that's all you do. It's just something that you bring in at times. And it's, it's sensory, it's embodied, it's quiet, and it's, um, it's just a nice adjunct to a therapeutic relationship. Interesting. Never, I'd never heard of that before this film either. It was, it was heartbreaking to see her dump her sand out. That was like the hardest moment for me. <laughs> Makes a I great can possibly sort of metaphor. make it better to actually cl clarify what the sand actually is. Mm -hmm. She said it's rocks ground by time into grains. No, <laughs> it's parrotfish poop. <laughs> Wait a minute, it's what? <laughs> parrotfish poop. Even Write better. that down. Wait a minute, this can you, this can is where the white coral island <laughs> sand comes from. <laughs> Parrotfish, you know, the big fish which uh, mm -hmm. chew on coral and the algae with, oh. off the reef, and they poop out this beautiful white sand. And so all these sand beaches are basically parrotfish poop. Sorry. I like the sand even better now <laughs> because, no, I'm not joking. <laughs> it, because it's been like processed through the. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm sending an email to the filmmakers just so they can make that little correction <laughs> <laughs> to the film. <laughs> right over here, yeah. No, that's a different, completely different type of crab. If you, I mean, those are those are called coconut crabs. Those are actually modified, uh, highly derived uh, hermit crabs. Oh. You may just see that they only have four walking legs instead of four. Uh, I mean, two pairs instead of four pairs. Uh, well, they, they basically look like a huge hermit crab without a shell, and they are fully land living, mega huge crabs, and they are prized for food qualities. They it taste just like coconut. They eat coconuts. If that's the case, how, how could one live 70 years, as we were sort of led to believe? I doubt uh, that. Yeah. I'm not oh. sure where this data come from, but I cannot <laughs> confirm I or wonder. deny that claim. I don't know my <laughs> coconut crabs nearly well enough. If there, I mean, just <laughs> generally in nature, it's my impression that delicious things have lower lifespans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, yes, that's true. That's straight from a layman, folks. <laughs> I, I happen to know a, a little bit about this from, from doing research, and it's been a, um, uh, it, it has been a political flashpoint in elections, um, very much in the way that um, sort of asylum is a political flashpoint in, in America and will be, one hopes, a flashpoint in the next election. Um, but, but yeah, it is, it is a, a point of contention, and Australians are very aware of it. It's one of the big sort of uh, dividing lines between um, you know, right-wingers and left-wingers. So a, a good number of people would like to see more asylum seekers make it to, uh, to Australia. That's not just, a scientific question, but... I'd just like to point out that Australians are much better in this regard than people in this country. <laughs> much and the general than institutions than of that type in this country are ridiculously wi much more worse. So, and more numerous. Australia probably has just one, that one. Right. You saw it. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> Hopefully. In what form? Yeah. Yeah. But so the yeah, the question is how can why we do why we have them mm -hmm. in the first place? Why we cannot be just kind to everybody like we are just unconsciously kind mm -hmm. kind to silly crabs. This yeah. is a this is a, a big question. This is we could have even other disciplines on stage to talk about this, um, uh, but I don't think we're going to solve this problem. Although we need to. I'm glad you asked that. Um, that was something that I became clearer about with e you know the, the few times that I've s that I saw it. Um, so there's two or three mentions of the fact that they have them there to check off on a checklist that they are offering counseling. But in fact, they, the systemic for, you know, forces, it, are, are, they don't want, they, they, they're not there to help them. They're there to harm them. And, um, but they get to say, you know, oh, we, we have these counselors. 
And that's the conundrum for her is that she's there to offer solace, support, comfort. You know, she's good at what she does. You know, there's four or five kind of meetings with clients where you can kind of feel that she's relating well to them. She's letting them process their feelings. She's not being stupid about giving them tips. She's just letting them kind of, she's being, she's presencing them and, and resourcing them. And then they make it so that they can't show up. And that's, the, that's what is called moral injury. She can't do her job anymore, but they get to say that they have counselors. So it's kind of uh, smoke and mirrors. You can almost sort of imagine that if you were to show up in South Texas at a, one of these detention camps, and it's run by these brutal ICE you know, soldiers, uh, and they're there, and their idea is like we maintain order, we punish, we were, you know, punish and detain, and then you show up, and they possibly indulge you a little bit, but yeah, the least give amount you like they possibly five could. And yeah, yeah. Tell you what to do and exactly. what you can't do, right. and uh, especially in this viewing, they noticed um, that that the the workers, whether you're a doctor, a teacher, or a counselor you could go to jail for two years if you mention any of your concerns about the harm being done. Mm -hmm. So now they're harming not just the inmates, you know, the detainees, but they're threatening the well-being of the people who are there to help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, are, she leaves. These are things that influence yeah. security state apparatuses that right. we're hopefully evolving past to bring it back to science, I hope, in some small, desperate way. There's a lot to say there, so I'm going to try to be concise. Um, so The Hungry Ghost is a teaching from, is an Eastern teaching from Buddhism and from Zen practice. And there are a couple of ways in which it's used. And the way that I'm the most familiar with is, um, you know, they're depicted as beings with tiny mouths and huge stomachs that are cavernously hungry and grasping to gratify. But because the mouth is so small and any water will burn their mouth, they can't take in any nutrients. So they're constantly, you know, like grasping and seeking. And in a way, this is now what is being um, um, likened to, you know, what addictive natures are. And not just substance use, but like consumption. So like all of us. Um, are kind of on the spectrum of hungry ghosts because we're always like grasping for something, a new hat, sorry, <laughs> or, you know, like better, you know, more exercise or technology or sex or food or alcohol or what have you. In this story, All it's... the above. <laughs> in this story, it's more, of, it's more, it's a more general metaphor of just a lost soul that has not been allowed to cross over to safety and security and home. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, so the, the, you know, it's interesting. We don't know any of those clients' names in each session. We hear about M Muhammad and uh, Amin, at the, uh, Ahmed? Ahmed. Ahmed at the end, but we don't know which is which. You can kind of figure out which is which. And so they're nameless. And um, you know, there's like a depersonalization there, and it's the same for the, f the Chinese immigrants who came to the island, who were uh, died as minors, were not named, were not identified. So they're hungry ghosts in the sense that they are not given a home, and they're just wandering, and there's a sense of lostness that prevails and is now like intergenerational on that island, which is named for Christmas. You know, which there's another lost and wandering story there. So heavy. Sorry. I, yeah, uh, <laughs> quite all right. I could. Well, maybe I should <laughs> add about hungry, hungry ghosts because I kind of had a, a couple of brushes with Buddhist culture. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go. Uh, it's one of the levels at which you can reincarnate if you are, uh, if you're craving things in this life, mm. which is very common, commonly happens. <laughs> Yeah, you reincarnate as a hungry ghost with a great uh, probability. So your grandmother could be a hungry ghost right now. So all these ch all these mm. beliefs and chanting and trying and mm. praying for them, it's basically because they are just like you, and you could be next 
among them, and the next reincarnation could make them better. So that's what they're praying for. That's what they're leaving like the food by the street for. There is a day of the hungry ghosts in Singapore where they just leave the food by the street uh, and beer as well. You have to open it because they cannot open it by themselves. Right. So this kind of Guinness can mm -hmm. standing out by the side of the street. Well, uh, I, I think that the, the whole metaphor is a little bit misplaced here. Here the hungry ghosts are depicted as a lost soul type of thing who's wandering around and cannot find its own place. Uh, it's uh, in, in Buddhist lore. It, uh -huh. I don't think it's quite like, like that, yeah. but it makes a nice uh, addition to the story. It's like, <laughs> yeah, migration. Uh, we're not. We don't know where they're going, and though the crabs don't know where they're going. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I I agree with you there. I do. So I'm I'm curious. We talked about people evolving over hundreds of years. So 100 years ago, had I asked a hard scientist here to have this kind of discussion, and we became uh, involved in a discussion about ghosts and metaphysics and mythology, that scientist, by and large, probably would have stormed out of the place. Um, so do you feel that hard science, um, the, si the kind of science that you're engaged in on a daily basis, uh, can benefit from metaphysics, from mythology, are, are there are there uh, stories there that that feed into hard science? You don't understand how science works. It's, that's very true. <laughs> Thank you for that. Science is storytelling. It's just a different uh -huh. types of stories, but it's mm -hmm. the same kind of stuff. It's art. It's storytelling. Mm -hmm. You cannot make a good science paper, or get good science study if it's not a good story. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. Yes, we do benefit from all that massively. Mm -hmm how to make a compelling case, what, you, what the point you want to make, which is about the uh, conditions in this as, asylum thing, uh, with whatever you have and you can bring into, I mean, this is all completely relevant for, for me personally. Because science, is a, uh, science yeah. is, a is a detective story in a weird sort of way, isn't it? You're sort of deducing. Uh, I guess, I guess, but al also it's about making a point. Also, it's about engaging the reader. Also, it's about, about making a nice presentation, making a good. It's the same exact mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. as any uh, movie making or uh, writing a book. It's mm -hmm. the same stuff. Uh, science is art. It's just mm -hmm. better job security. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. S it's not a story about the crabs. No. Nobody made any claims about crabs here. We were just shown some crabs going somewhere. We were not <laughs> We were not lied to, if that's what you're asking. So, but and as used as a metaphor, which we, and the brain makes a metaphor out yeah. of the context, mm -hmm. right? You're shown something in the context of something else, and you connect it in a completely unexpected way, and that that was done masterfully here. And biology of the crabs is besides mm -hmm. the point, mm -hmm. I think. And I'm not offended at all. Uh, <laughs> nice. So we've not been misled. That's always good. We're continuing our record of not misleading people. So I'm just trying to think of a kind of way to answer that's meaningful and not too convoluted. I think one of the things I like about the movie is um, the way the, the, the nervous systems are shared. You know, um, I don't know about you, but as I sat there, you know, I was like, you know, <laughs> trying to kind of like, you know, keep my sleeve out so that I could dab like a tear. I mean, it's a moving movie, you know, it, it's evocative. And um, I'm sharing the, the nervous system that's in the movie and she's sharing the nervous system with her clients and the people who are helping the crabs are kind of doing their thing and the people who are offering, you know, making their offerings to the hungry ghosts. So this, this notion of walls and detention centers is an illusion. Um, you can't really, you know, the mother and the son that have been separated aren't really apart and the harm that he's experienced, she's now, you know, she's now hurting herself and now he's harming himself because of that. So it's just an illusion to think that we're not all hurting. And so that's a very kind of, you know, it may sound spiritual or it may sound um, 
too abstract, but as soon as, you know, as, if we can just work towards realizing that when, um, that, uh, that the suffering of others is not separate from ourselves, maybe we'll stop uh, building walls and um, um, feeling threatened by others and just, you know, maybe that's a long-term proposition, but it's something to um, reach for in everyday life. Uh, in our own lives, in our families, in our communities, and I think we, I think we can do it, and I think we actually are doing it in ways that are not always obvious, and I think that's why we need to look for the good stories that are out there in addition to these stories, because I think we can find both. Are there, are there models in the animal kingdom of overcoming territoriality and aggression? Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to add in, in the same vein, yes, I mean, uh, in a way, we're fighting our uh, caveman instincts, which we, we've been a hunter-gatherer society until about 300 generations ago, which, is, which means that in evolutionary terms, we're still hunter-gatherers, tribal people living in caves, trying to organize into groups and protect our people against their people. This what uh, took us through like 200,000 years of previous evolution. And now, in the past 5,000 years, everything switched. But we did not catch up yet, mm -hmm. genetically. We're still tending to like put a whole bunch of people on a completely level surface, and they will organize into tribes and start quarreling with each other. Mm -hmm. That's because that's what we evolved to do. That's what was really advantageous back then. Uh, and it, uh, it's really good to see that it's getting less and less that through the uh, human recorded history. We're less and less violent towards other people compared to our people. But these tendencies is what actually uh, hurts and stops and hinders human progress right now. We need to eventually this, well, the way the trend goes, we will sometime overcome that and we will stop dividing the world into ours and theirs. Uh, but what I'm saying is that it's like evolution we're uh, fighting against. It's ingrained in our genetics of our, our thought. We have to manually sort of override it mm -hmm. using our consciousness. Yes. Uh, many peop uh, most people tend to trust what their brain tells them. Oh. It's like, oh, that's uh -oh. me. That's my own thought. Mm -hmm. I'm going to... What your brain tells them is the Neanderthal thought. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not you. It's like... It, hunter-gatherer brain, it's kind of com completely useless. You have to control it. You have to reassess. You have to check what, you, what your brain is telling. Your subconscious desire is usually stupid in the current world. You want to do a firmware update, too, every once in a while with books? You that's, know? That's, yeah. a great, that's a great way. Yeah, firmware. Yeah, our firmware is completely outdated, oh, and yeah, we yeah. need to put a lot of software on top of this to correct those errors. So people just need to realize they need to think a little bit more. It, from, from my perspective, of course, it would be um, seeing the limitations of what's possible and um, recalibrating. So um, as caregivers, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I actually don't like to use the word healer. Ugh, it's just a little stinky for me healer, you know, it's like I think of myself as uh, somebody who's with people, who bears witness to their experience, who, you know, offers compassionate presence, things like that. And so uh, somebody working in a, uh, are you talking about in a detention center environment like that? Yeah. I, well, first of all, I think we need to really be clear about the system that we're working in and not have any, uh, you know, just to really like know the system and see the limitations. When I talk, you know, maybe the term moral injury is a little too sort of like a phrase or a term. We're talking about where your integrity of work is jeopardized. You can't really do much. So you do what you can. You be with, you care, and you presence. But you have to stay resourced. If you're not going to stay resourced um, as a caregiver, you're going to go into despair. You're going to experience empathic distress, secondary trauma, caregiver fatigue and burnout, and moral injury. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people who do that work do it for a little while, 
and then they, they find other work because they, they don't want to um, take themselves down. And so there's an ethics of care in an environment like that. There's, a, there's an organization here in Austin, I forget the exact name of it, but they work with um, victims of torture and um, um, terrorism. I can't remember the exact name of it, but they do that Refugee, kind of work. Refugee services of Austin? Yeah, may, um, I, I can't remember. And you know, they actually had a name change, but they're dealing with that kind of trauma and so there's a lot of um, awareness of uh, care of the ethics of care. It's not like ethics, like in the bo the board ethics of confidentiality and forms and HIPAA and things like that. This is a deeper level of ethics, which is, you know, are you cut out for it? And how educated are you? And how well do you take care of yourselves? And how realistic are you about what you can do? Does that help a little bit? If you want anything a little more nuanced than that, you know, find me afterwards. <laughs> well, I want to thank so much to thank our guest, uh, Misha Motz, and also Gingy Willingham for joining us for this very special discussion. Uh, it's been a tough movie to wrap our heads around, and I think we've gotten at least a third of the way there. So thank you guys both so much. <laughs> I really you. appreciate thank it. You. Thanks, all of you. Thank you.